Psalm 103, and it's about in the middle of your Bible. And we'll start with the first verse. This is a psalm of David, and it's a great word from God's word. David, in the psalms, often he's, he's talking to the Lord. A lot of the psalms are prayers. He's speaking directly to the Lord. In Psalm 103, as it kicks off, he's not talking to the Lord. He's talking to his own heart, and that's what I like about this one. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Oh, do not forget his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquity. Who heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit. And who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. Who sustains you with good. So that your youth is renewed like the eagles. And that's not nearly done. With all the benefits of uh, the Lord. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Uh, Another translation that says, Praise the Lord, I tell myself. And never forget the good things he does for me. Just never forget the good things God has done. And here's the, you have to make up your mind to do that. That, The default mode of us is we're going to forget a whole lot about relationship to God. And we're going to have to do some things to make sure we remember. On, uh, in my Bible reading plan for the last half of this year, I'm reading in the Psalms every Sunday. So I read through several Psalms today. and I'm amazed in my study of the Psalms how many times God's people are called to remember. Do not forget. Remember. Because it's a plague of uh, God's followers. To forget all the good things only to focus on the bad things, the deficits where we feel like God's coming up short. But there are whole chapters in the Psalms dedicated to this, uh, Psalm 78, Psalm 103, Psalm 106, Psalm 137 are all dedicated just to that idea of remember, remember, remember. Psalm 78 says, when we forget, it tests God's patience, it frustrates the Holy One of Israel, and another part says, it makes God's anger to rise. Now, we talk about forgetfulness. We say, well, sometimes I just have a hard time remembering things. Just a bad habit. Just the way I am. But the f- kind of forgetfulness <coughs> where we're forgetting God. Well, when you start forgetting God, that gets to be sin. Not just a bad habit. Not just a, a wavering heart. <coughs> it's sin. And I want to give you some examples. And I'd like to <coughs> you should turn a page or so over. And look at Psalm 106. Now, Psalm 106. I'm, I'm going to read a couple of these verses just now, starting in verse 6. And then I'll make some reference to some other things as we move along the next three things that we'll talk about. So here's Psalm 106 says, verse 6. Both we and our fathers have sinned. We've committed iniquity. We've done wickedness. Our fathers, when they were in Egypt, did not consider your wondrous works. They did not remember the abundance of your steadfast love, but rebelled by the sea at the Red Sea. Here's some things that, uh, just good reminders of why it's a forgetting God, forgetting the great things he has done, forgetting his benefits is going to be a bad plan. Here's the first one. Forgetting leads to unbelief and rebellion. So here are the Israelites. This is Psalm 106. Israelites, they have been in slavery for 400 years. And they have witnessed in Egypt these 10 miraculous plagues where God God not only only brought down judgment on the Egyptians, but, but each one of the plagues is tied to deeper realities that just are a punch in the gut of what, the Egyptians believed about the nature of their gods, their false gods. And so all these plagues take place, and God miraculously delivers them. Not only that, but they walk off with the wealth of Egypt. This is the part sometimes that's forgotten, is that as they leave, the Egyptians, part of the thing was, Egyptians, you got to give all your stuff to these slaves. So they, they walked out with all kinds of wealth, And they walk out and they finally get to the Red Sea and it looks like there's no way past, no way around. The Egyptians now just changed their minds and they're coming after us. We're in deep trouble. And uh, they start to complain. 
they forget everything that just happened back in Egypt. Now, after they crossed through the Red Sea, and the part about this, so they, God says, okay, you need another miracle? I got a good one for you. And the Red Sea divides walls of water on either side, and they walk through on dry land, and they walk through what was the, the bed of a body of water. They come out the other side with now the dust of a dried Red Sea bed all over them, and while the dust is still on their shoes and their clothes, it's only a, a short amount of time before they're saying, we don't like what's on the dinner menu. We don't have enough water. Uh, how long is this going to take? Are we there yet? Is there someone else who could do this besides Moses? And they start laying down criticism after criticism after criticism. Forgetting God leads to unbelief and it will lead to rebellion. That's true then, it's true now. Forgetting makes us do foolish things. So they finally make their way to Mount Sinai, Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. And Moses, he goes up the mountain to meet with God. God's going to give him the law. So God's speaking to him and there are rumblings and, and smoke on the mountain. But they say, well, Moses seems like it's taking a little long. We're not sure if he's still up there. We think maybe he died. Maybe God killed him. Maybe God's not even up there. We don't know what's going on. All we know is we're tired of waiting because it's already been just over a month. And so they say, well, what are we going to do now? We have no leader. And, oh, we do have all this gold and stuff from the Egyptians. So what if we kind of pool our resources and they build themselves a golden calf. And they decide, well, we need a God. Not sure what's happened to Moses. Not sure what's happened to our God. So let's just build ourselves a golden calf. And once we've built it but with our own hands, then we're going to fall down and worship that. And uh, in verse 20 of Psalm 106, it describes that event. They exchange the glory of God for the image of an ox that eats grass. They traded Almighty God for an idol made with hands that's like an ox that eats grass, of all things. When you start forgetting God, you'll start making bad choices. When you get impatient with God and decide you're going to take off and take care of business on your own without Him, you're going to end up at some dead-end roads, and you're going to end up in some dark places, and you're going to do some dumb things. Third thing. Forgetting God ignites God's anger. They forgot God who had saved them from the Egyptians, who had done great things, wonderful things, awesome things. And Psalm 106, 21 through about 23, sums it up. Uh, God just declared, I will destroy you. It's coming. I'm just going to destroy you. Now, thankfully for them, Moses steps into the gap. And Moses says, no, no, no. Please, God, for your glory and for your name, don't destroy these people. Uh, one of my favorite things in reading through those stories is if, if God and Moses had ever had a bad day the same day with these people, they would have been destroyed a long time ago. Because sometimes God wants to destroy them, and Moses intercedes, no, no. And sometimes Moses says, well, I've had it up to here with these people. You can have them. Feel free to rain down lightning bolts on them. And God says, no, we have another plan. Uh, it's all that preserved him. All of us, all of us today in the room, and some of you are going through some big stuff, I know. Some of you are going through difficulties. This is a season that's tough for you. Uh, that was true in the first hour. It's true every, every day. A lot of us, uh, we're, not, we're certainly not living problem-free lives. But, how, uh, but in spite of all that, all of us can say, God has done great and wonderful and awesome things in our lives. There are things that we can point to. Uh, I was thinking about this, this this morning in connection with some interactions with uh, friends of mine who made their way uh, after their church was over in some third world places to an internet cafe and just said, uh, brought, send me greetings uh, as they often do on a Sunday morning and prayer support for what we're doing here. 
you know, if you don't have anything else, you have your problems, you have your difficulties, you have your challenges, absolutely. But, but you won the birth lottery, a lot of you. Now, we're a many nations congregation. We have people from a lot of different nations of the world represented in our, in our building. Uh, and you made it here, and you're living in this country, a lot of you. It's just, you just won the birth lottery, and you just happen to be born in this place instead of in some place where there's no no clean water to drink and you're never going to have electricity and you're never going to have educational opportunity and your, your uh, life expectation is going to be 40 years, which is what we ran into in Zambia this last uh, summer. But instead you live here. Not because of anything you did. Not because of uh, anything that you deserved. But just because God saw fit in His grace to allow such a thing to be. And that's just one of many things, the freedom to be here today, the freedom to worship, the, the opportunities that you have in life. And we have a lot to thank God for in this day. However, for us, like for these folks, we see amazing things, miracle things, God-sized things. And then we hit that first bump in the road we hit the first hurdle we we get tripped up we, we run into an obstacle we run into a crisis and we will we are promised in this world you'll have tribulation and just to clarify occasionally we have to reset the clock on this some of you you're new and you haven't heard this before and so this this will be wow i never thought about that just in case as you watch the news as you follow world events just to clarify this is not heaven just all clear? This is not heaven. This is not the perfect place. This is not the problem-free place. This is the broken place. This is a place of darkness where sin is making a mess of things in lives and in the world. So this, is, this is not heaven. And yet we have this expectation that somehow it ought to be. And we're putting all of our, all of our effort and all of our heart into here instead of looking toward there as the place where we're going to be for a very long time. If, I, if genetics and trying to take somewhat care of myself works out for me, I have, I have several more years left, I hope, and to, to invest in this world and enjoy what God has provided here. But I'm going to be in heaven forever and ever. So probably ought to be laying up some treasure in heaven if that's uh, where I'm going to be for a very, very long time. But here's what happens. We run into our trial. We run into our test. And are we quick to remember what God has done? Or are we just worry and fret and despair? I was reading in uh, the book of Exodus when I was preparing this message a few weeks ago. And, and I was just stunned that every time in the book of Exodus, the people want to abandon ship. God's done this, and God's done this, miracle and miracle and miracle. And then, uh, I'm not sure God can really do this. I think God's forgotten us. I don't think God really, really cares. And they had so much of that over and over and over again. And I look at the people and I say, how can they complain like they do when they've experienced so much of God? How can they be just so ignorant, so forgetful, so dumb and the God of the universe, he's just taken the most powerful man in the world, the Pharaoh of Egypt, tossed him around like a rag doll. He has undone the most powerful nation in the world at the time. And God didn't just humble Pharaoh. He broke his spirit and revealed just how helpless he was. And a bunch of slaves walked out, left his nation in a shambles. And what a, this, is, this is a great redemptive event of the Old Testament. This is a big deal, an overwhelming miracle, nothing they could have accomplished on their own. And as soon as they get beyond, beyond being slaves, they start complaining about everything. Well, maybe we should have been better off as slaves. At least we knew what life was going to be like day to day, taking faith steps where we don't know what's going to happen next. That's no fun. And they get through the wilderness wandering of 40 years of griping, complaining, and doubting God forgetting all that he has done. And they get right up to the, the threshold of the promised land, and then we get all these reports coming out of Canaan, the land of promise. Joshua now is about to lead them in, and you remember how the story goes. As he's about to go in, what they find out is all of these pagans living in Canaan, God's people don't remember anything, but the pagans, they've been living with 
fear and dread of these people for a long time because they didn't forget the stories of what, what these folks, God, had done back in Egypt. They all know about the plagues. They've heard the stories about the parting of the Red Sea. And they're trembling at this group of people who are mostly just complaining about day-to-day -day activity. They've forgotten God. While the pagans, they still remember all the big stories. Now, it should not be so. God's people, God's people ought to be the ones who remember. But Israel's response to the spectacular deliverance from Egypt was not praise and worship and wholehearted trust in a glorious God. Instead, they're grumbling, they're complaining, they're murmuring, they're quarreling. And it is. Water supply. Don't like the water supply situation. Don't like what's on the menu. Don't like Moses as the leader. Maybe there's someone else. And how much longer until we get there? There's this spiritual amnesia that sets in, even among God's people, sometimes it seems like more among God's people. And so soon had this group of people forgotten God's gracious, miraculous deliverance. And we'd say, well, it's faithlessness. It's just not trusting God, not believing that God who did can still do. And it's a heart that says, and this is, well, this is where I feel it in me. I feel it in us. And a certainly American version of Christianity where we say, God does not know what he's doing. And if he would just take my advice and follow my plan, the universe would spend much more as it really ought to spend. And my life would be much more full if God would just, would just do it my way. And that's what they said, and that's what we say too often, because we forget we quickly forget. We only see the deficits. Here's what I like. Here's where it's coming up short. God, here's where you let me down. Here's where you need to do a better job. And we don't say it straight up to God like that in our prayer time. But it's where our hearts uh, can often land. And we, we can, uh, <laughs> some of us are good at this. You can remember every wrong thing someone's ever done to you. Well, you keep great score of that. But you don't remember the good things they ever did. You just keep, keep up with the bad stuff. You keep up with the shortcomings. And we do the same thing with God. Grumbling, whining, and thanklessness are, are not ultimately our heart's response to circumstances. Now, we blame our circumstances. Well, I have this job thing. I have this health thing. I have this relationship issue really wearing me out. And those things are real. But our griping, complaining, and murmuring is, is not a response to our circumstances or our scenery. It's a response to, it's a response to God and our doubt in Him and our forgetfulness in relationship to what He has done. And it reflects, it reflects a heart that may just be far from God. Spiritual amnesia is a deadly disease, and it threatens our faith and our joy. And what it does to us is it rots us from the inside out. How do you guard against this spiritual amnesia? And it is to remember. And that's why the Bible says it so often. That's why in the Lord's Supper, remember. And do this, remember. Because, oh, how quickly we forget. Remember God's deliverance. Remember his redemption. Establish it in your memory. Memorialize it. When I have become discouraged, and this has been a practice of mine for a long time, when I become discouraged, when I feel like, oh, look, because it's not hard to come up with your list of here are the things I wish were different in my life, things that I wish were right-sized or cleared out of the way. Uh, so I have my list of those things, and what I need is I need I need just to be drawn back to remember. And so I've gone to Psalm 103. Those verses I read a moment ago and on through that chapter. Because there's a lot more that, break, that gets broken out in that chapter on that theme. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his benefits. And I'll run through. Uh, my, my, I, don't, I don't journal daily, but I journal. And I have a notebook that now it's all an electronic version. And I'll go to that and I'll go back to pages and I'll just visit the benefits page 
of things. I'll, uh, sometimes I'll take a blank sheet of paper and I'll just start writing stuff down. Here are all the things God has done for me. God, bring them to mind because sometimes I'm too dumb to bring them to my own mind. Don't let me forget all the wonderful things you've done. Don't let me, don't let me get drifting so dark that, that I don't remember the light of your presence and your love and your power. Just don't, don't let me get that far from you. Forget not his benefits. Now, I have been a Christian for a while now. I've been following the Lord with uh, above average intention, probably. And I can look back now. See, I have the benefit of years at this point in my journey. I can look back and I can see things I did not see when I was younger. And sometimes, uh, age, age does have its benefits. And one of those is to be able to look back and remember all the things God has done. I think about, I think about the benefits that he's brought my way. And it's things like, there was, there was this girl that I thought, oh man, that relationship, this is where God... Not if it's your will. This has to be your will. This has to be the way this is going to go. And now, after decades, I can look back on that relationship and say, Oh, dear God, thank you so much that that went belly up. Thank you. Thank you. The shipwreck that would have come into my life, if that had been the case, oh, my goodness. She's on my, fa on my Facebook friend list. I see her pop up every once in a while. I think, oh, goodness <laughs> gracious. Thank you, God, for getting not his benefits. Um, when I was talking to First Baptist Church Allen, uh, you know, 20 something years ago, uh, there was another church that I really, well, my heart was inclined toward that place. There's so many things that lined up spiritual marker-wise. I thought, this has to be where God wants us to be. And we went through a series of interviews. We were right up to the end. And it came down to me and Tommy. And they called Tommy to be their pastor. And I'll tell you, I was devastated. I thought, there's so many things about this that I just knew. This is what God was working in us. This is where I pictured Pictured my, the road going for our family. And, and now I, I think, boy, Tommy went down with a ship. I'm glad I wasn't in that spot. I pray for Tommy that he can recover from the, there's some mean people in that place I did not know about. Boy, Tommy got to know him. Uh, I think, thank you, God. If you, if you follow the Lord for a while with some intention, you start seeing all these ways where he's at work and where he's protecting and guiding and caring. Forget not his benefits. The antidote to spiritual amnesia is to make every effort to recall and remember God's gracious deliverance. You remember God, but you remember, you remember, oh, the, they go back, the, the Red Sea, just, just the words Red Sea. Now, there are other the allusions to that deliverance, but the Red Sea, the greatest redemptive event in the uh, Old Testament, the Red Sea, that little phrase occurs two dozen times in the Old Testament. They just kept going back to that as a touchstone. Well, you know what? My touchstone I keep going back to is I was lost, separated from God by my sin, and I had no hope of restoration in my own effort by my own good intention. But I came to know Jesus Christ who died on the cross to pay for my sin and was raised from the dead. And he wiped clean my sin debt. And he came into my life and he's changing me and he keeps on changing me to be more like Jesus as I lean into him. And I know I'm going to heaven one of these days. Not because I'm any kind of great guy, but because of Jesus in me. And I will not forget what Jesus has done for me. I will remember. I don't want that to ever, ever fade. And that act of remembering, it awakens in me a gratitude. And when everything seems cloudy, it clears things out. So there's a joy in my heart over what Jesus means to me and what he's done for me. To know that he loves me, that he cares for me, that he, he knows me, that he keeps me. And that's what we're remembering today. The goodness and graciousness of God in His Son, Jesus Christ. The power of the Holy Spirit. So today...
we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And we're going to do this because we are called by the Lord to remember some important things. Now, in our church, different folks do this in different ways. In our church, we don't do this often, but we do it regularly. We do it often enough to keep the remembering part before us and seldom enough that when we do it, it's special. It's a big deal. Like Jeff this morning, the songs that he led us in, those songs are wrapped around Jesus and wrapped around the cross. And we're going to talk about that story and we're going to focus on, on this throughout the hour. I just didn't, I just didn't ever want to tag something as precious as the body and blood of Christ, just tag it on to the end of a sermon about something else. But I wanted it to be, this is what we're talking about today. I wanted it to be highlighted, spotlighted, important, not just routine. Or that it happens that way sometimes. It can become routine. Some of you, you've been believers for a long time. You've been in church for a long time. And for you, you just get in the habit of just doing what you've always done. You say, oh yeah, Lord's Supper. Done that for a long time. I know how, I know how the system works. And I'll take the cup and I'll take the bread. And I'll uh, the bread and then I'll take the cup. And then I'm all good. And I have done my spiritual thing for the, for the service. And we forget what we're remembering and we don't focus our hearts in a significant way on, on the story and on the, on the Savior. Now others, it's just unfamiliar territory for you. What in the world? I know this is a religious ritual thing that Christians do, but I don't know why. I don't know. And you can be just unprepared and you miss the meaning of what this is really to be about. So what is the Lord's Supper? Well, we celebrate... Uh, we celebrate holidays during the course of the year. We celebrate Memorial Day. We remember those who gave their lives in uh, caring, protecting, preserving our country. On Independence Day, we remember the freedoms and the blessings that we experience and enjoy as a nation. Uh, Christmas, we remember Jesus, the gift of God's Son. Jesus came. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And Easter, we remember the death, the burial, and resurrection of Christ. The Lord's Supper is a time to remember something very important. This bread and this cup, there's nothing mystical or magical about these elements. Some, some folks uh, elevate the body and blood to, to levels that aren't supported by Scripture. Uh, when, when we think about Think about that. Jesus said, this is my body, this is my blood. There was a time when also Jesus said, I am the door. If anyone's going to come to God, going to come through me, I'm the door. But he didn't mean I'm a piece of wood that swings on hinges, right? He meant this is a symbol of a greater spiritual reality. This is, represents something that is eternal. And that's what happens with the Lord's Supper. Not sacred in and of itself. Doesn't lead to salvation. Doesn't bring us good luck. We don't, we don't benefit spiritually just by the act of coming down here thoughtlessly, carelessly, and uh, taking, taking them in. However, when we gather together as believers in the quietness of a time of worship, with our hearts focused on Him, together loving one another, offering ourselves anew to God, the Lord's Supper is deeply meaningful and precious, purposeful. A couple of things. The Lord's Supper draws us together as family. When Jesus began the Lord's Supper, it, it flowed out of a Passover meal. Passover is something that Jewish families did together. It was a family event. It was a special honor to be invited to share in a Passover with a family. On this occasion, Jesus gathered with his disciples in the upper room. His closest friends, his closest followers, his disciples. And they too were family. I love my family. And uh, my extended family. I love gathering with my family. But I love gathering with my church family. Because when I think about my, my family that I grew up with, relatives, uh, a lot of them because I'm blessed on both sides of my family. And I got a lot of believers. We'll be together forever in heaven. But when I gather together with the people of God, this is the eternal family, and that makes it extra special and extra precious. We come together, and we're in this together, and there are eternal things that are happening in us, and so we share this. Last week, we talked a little bit about what the church is, and there are me and God things. 
you know, me and God, uh, we got together this morning. We spent some time talking about things, my prayer time, and reading from God's Word. And God did a lot of speaking to me uh, today through things I was uh, reading in the Psalms. So this is the me and God. When we gather together like this, that's the we and God side, side of the faith. And most of what the Bible talks about about the Christian life is a, is a we and God experience. And the Lord's Supper pulls us into that. It reminds me. Yeah, I'm not alone in this thing. I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged to gather with other believers on any Lord's Day just to, to know that I'm not the only one that's seeking to live for Jesus and seeking to represent Him in this world. I remember the shared experience we have in Christ, the shared hope in Christ, whatever, whatever life brings. And the Lord's Supper reminds us of the gospel. We take the Lord's Supper, and this is a time to remember what happened in and around the events of six hours one Friday when Jesus hung on a cross. And it reminds us of the people and the events, the things Jesus taught, the things Jesus did. And we're reminded that his body, his blood, the sinless son of God, <laughs> paid the debt for sin. And because he was God and he was sinless, he was qualified and the only one qualified to do so. He was raised from the dead. And we come with deep appreciation for God's plan for the world and for us as revealed in his word. But it's amazing how quickly we forget. We sing about the wondrous cross. It's amazing how quickly we forget the wondrous cross and the victory of the resurrection. The, the hope we have of eternal life in Christ. The Lord's Supper just calls us back to that. To remember God's plan. God's plan for us. God's work in us. Salvation, the gift of salvation, redemption, forgiveness, all those things through Jesus Christ our Lord. I heard this when I was younger, and I didn't have, a, have nearly the appreciation for it I do today. And you may or may not have a great appreciation for it today. Again, we did a lot of prayer request stuff last Sunday. And we've been praying for you this week in the big sweeping things that you're, you're facing the struggles of your life and uh, just know you're being lifted up. We're going to have a prayer time in a couple of weeks. We're going to block a big chunk of Sunday morning for prayer. But with, with everything that I, I pray for that I wish was different, that I wish God would move in, lives that I people dear to me that I wish God would be able to break through and transform the burdens I have for people I love and care about and for God's kingdom work in our city and in the world. I came back to this that I heard a long time ago and it's more real to me now than it ever, I never imagined it would be. If God never answers another prayer that I pray, if he never, he never moves in anything that I wish he would move in, if if the, if, the, if the struggles and the hurts that uh, I'm walking through now never lift in this life, if God never does any one more thing for me besides what he did at the cross for me, saving my sinful soul, I got all I need. And I will remember and I'll be thankful till I join him in heaven. If I never have anything else, that gift alone ought to carry me forward. For most of us, it's easier to remember a, a bad time than a good time. Most of us have too many bad memories, too many heartaches, too many sorrowful things that we've experienced. But the Lord commands us to keep good memories, memorials, Benjamin Franklin, he said a lot of things that uh, we're never sure where he was spiritually. But he did say this, and I think he hit this one well. He said, engrave the Lord's benefits in marble. And I like that he used the word benefits like uh, Psalm 103. Engrave the Lord's benefits in marble and write your injuries in the dust. Temporary. So we celebrate the Lord's Supper. And we do this together. And while this is a we and God experience, there's still a me and God experience in the Lord's Supper. And that's because this does 
set us alone before God in some ways about what's going on in our hearts and where we are in relationship to Him. And this is spiritual preparation that needs to take place. Paul talked about it in uh, 1 Corinthians 11. He says, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Uh, sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is just to say, we do, this, do the Lord's Supper, we participate in the Lord's Supper. This is not something we take lightly, not something we just blow past. Is this not a big deal or it's a religious thing? You do this carelessly, unprepared, thoughtlessly. The way Paul paints the picture in 1 Corinthians 11, guilty of the body and blood of the Lord, it's as if we are we're taking our place at the foot of the cross alongside those who mocked Jesus while he was dying for the sins of the world on the cross. The, the people who, who, who made fun of him, who said, this is what you deserve because you're a false teacher, because you're a terrible person, because you were disrupting our religious practice. And that's where judgment. So just as a, just as a disclaimer... I don't want to lead you into sin uh, by letting you do that carelessly, thoughtlessly, without really preparing for it. So we're going to give you some time to prepare just now. And it's a, it does say in an unworthy manner, because I tell you what, I'm never worthy of uh, this memorial meal, the Lord's Supper. But an unworthy manner is doing it where I just didn't prepare, where I'm hanging on to sin and I'm kind of enjoying my sin. Where I'm, I'm hard and I'm okay with being hard. I'm disobedient and I'm okay with being disobedient. That's where we're going to have some preparation time. And there are going to be verses on the screens that are going to help you with some of that preparation time. Get your heart focused. There are things you need to pray about. Like, God, what, what, what do I need to confess as sin? What do I need to turn away from? What do I need to take up? What, do I, what a step of obedience am I holding back on that I really need to... I really need to engage and answer those questions and respond to God's calling on your life. And then, in a worthy manner, you'll be ready to take the Lord's Supper, ready to take this step. I'll, I'll tell you this, uh, if you're working on those things and it takes you longer than we're going to have for the Lord's Supper today, you spent your time well. Preparing, getting your heart focused, getting your heart right. Because the preparation part is much more important than the taking the Lord's Supper part.